Good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Lucia Uribe. I'm the director of Arigato International in Geneva. First of all, let me apologize for not being present with you today in this important conference. Due to personal reasons, I'm unable to be with you, but I'm grateful to the organizers of the conference for allowing me to share my views through this medium, and I hope that there will be opportunities in the future to engage in dialogue with you. The title of this discussion, Violence Radicalization of Religious Conviction, is perhaps one of the most important topics lately discussed in the media, and it that is currently in our minds with the several recent episodes of recruitment of young people into violent extremist groups. Governments, civil society organizations, UN agencies, research institutions are all turning to understand what leads a young person into a violent extremist group using violence to address their needs and concerns. It's not an easy topic to discuss, particularly when the topic itself has been politicized and words like radicalization, religion, convictions, intervention, or even education are generalized, blame upon, and used without a proper analysis of what leads to violence and the different factors that influence such behavior and actions. In this presentation, I will address the push and pull factors that lead young people to join violent extremist groups and to adhere to religious fundamentalist views. And I will explore the role of education in exacerbating those factors, but also in mitigating and helping to transform them. I will also share pedagogical approaches and educational good practices that can serve to learn to live together and challenge religious fundamentalism. When we refer to fundamentalism, we often understand it as going back to the fundamentals of one's own belief system. Religious fundamentalism refers to going against the secular system and often to the strict application of certain dogmas and ideologies. It aims to put religion and one's own belief system at the center of the public life, to reestablish, in a way, its initial ideas which they believe have been lost. However, only a small proportion of the people who might be called fundamentalists use violent means to pursue their goals and they cannot be equated to terrorists. This is a critical distinction. Most of these people only want to live a religious life, as they deem important, often in a society that doesn't allow the free expression of their beliefs or that discriminate them against or leave them behind. What are then the factors that lead a young person to become a fundamentalist? or to adhere to religious fundamentalist views or extremist ideas. Let us look at first to the push factors. This refers to the structural conditions that can create space for fundamentalism to take place. Structural conditions such as poverty, grievances, lack of access to economic markets, social and political processes or justice are factors that can push people, and particularly young people, into extremist groups or to the creation of extremist views to validate their identities, their rights, and the expression of who they are. People, and particularly young people, have a need of belonging, of being recognized and allowed to express their thoughts. We all want to feel safe and want our dignity respected. People need to feel part of a community where they can grow, thrive, and achieve their dreams in equal basis. Young people, are in search of meaning. When these conditions are not there, there is a glitch in the system that leads to disconnection, discontent, alienation, frustration, and meaningless. Do our educational systems provide spaces for children and young people to develop a sense of meaning and belonging? Do our educational systems are equipped to pre pre promote inclusion respond to social and economic needs, and help children and young people to develop skills to respond and transform peacefully to those glitches in the social systems. Our education systems and content can also play a role in exacerbating the conditions for alienation and exclusion. Education systems that do not take into consideration the diversity of the community, that do not encourage critical thinking, that do not prioritize the development of global citizenship skills, and create the spaces to nurture values and spirituality and in children and youth are very much contributors to extremism and alienation. It is, of course, 
not enough to talk about formal education, when the development ecosystem of a child, of a young person, is composed of the family, religious institutions, school, media, social media, and the neighborhood where they grow up. Therefore, it is necessary to address these places and promote education that goes beyond the school system. Family dynamics and the interaction with peers can also push young people to violent extremism. Our parents and caregivers, and adults in general, appreciative of diversity and respectful of differences with others? Our families, environments where children are encouraged to speak and participate, or on the contrary, where their views are suppressed and not heard? Our families, environments where dialogue is encouraged to resolve differences and where children and youth are allowed to question, think critically, and create their own, create their own ideas? Or on the contrary, are families places where the gap between young people and adults tend to expand and where verbal and physical violence is the norm? When it comes to pull factors, social media plays a significant role in widely conveying violent messages, targeting those youth who might find themselves in the conditions I have explained before. The use of social networks and social media strategies for the recruitment of young people into violent extremist groups are currently more professionalized and refined to feed them in the minds of young people feelings of anger, revenge, belonging to something that gives meaning and recognition to the individual and collective identities. I mentioned that education can be used to exacerbate violent extremism and to create the conditions for alienation and exclusion. However, the opposite can also be said, and it is much uh, true. Education is a powerful tool to challenge stereotypes, prejudices, violent views, exclusion and discrimination, not only through content, but also through systems that are consistent with principles that promote learning to live together and inclusion at all levels. ARIGAT International, which is the organization I represent, developed in collaboration with UNESCO and UNICEF a manual titled Learning to Live Together, an intercultural and interfaith program for ethics education. The program has been implemented in more than 30 countries around the world. It is a program for educators, teachers, youth leaders, social workers, to nurture ethical values and spirituality in children and youth that will help them strengthen their identity and critical thinking, ability to make well-grounded decisions, respect and work with people of other cultures and religions, and foster their individual and collective responsibilities in a global community. Learning to Live Together, this manual, was developed during a period of three years through testing workshops organized around the world by the Global Network Religions for Children, which is the network of Arigat International, with people of different faiths and secular backgrounds. Beyond its impact on teacher training, the Learning to Live Together program is a catalyst for building social cohesion, challenge violence, promote reconciliation and nurture values that can foster the conditions to learn to live together with people of different cultures and beliefs. There are several methodological principles and approaches that can mitigate and help transforming the conditions that can lead to violent extremism. I will attempt to list a few that, according to our experience in Arigato International, empower children and young people to challenge extremism and fundamentalism that can lead to violence. The first one is conscientization. Paulo Freire describes conscientization as the process of developing a critical awareness of one's social reality through reflection and action. This is a critical component of all Arigato International Learning to Live Together programs, whereby educators relate concepts, discussions, methodologies, and activities to students' own reality and social context. Learning cannot happen in isolation or in a bubble. Discussions and dialogue about reality through case studies, role plays, simulations, focus groups, etc. percolate the entire learning process and help students initiate an unlearning process of preconceived ideas and unconscious exclusive views and perceptions. Conscientization goes beyond describing the reality out there. 
it entails inner and outer dialogues that help raising awareness about one's own place within the specific context and the role that the individual plays in that uh, context. This process is developed through several uh, methodologies throughout the program, though there are specific sessions in our program, such as interfaith cafes and learning circles that support the discussions of the social context, followed by personal spaces with journals or learning logs. The learning log is perhaps one of the, the, the most powerful tools that we introduce in our Learning to Live Together uh, programs. Through a learning uh, log, a journal, children can reflect about themselves, about the, the, the world, about the learning that just happened, about the relations with others, about uh, the relations with oneself. And I believe that this is very rare in our educational systems. We do not have enough spaces in our educational systems to reflect, to allow young people to go inside themselves and to think about who they are, who they want to be, who they want to become, what is shaping them, what moves them, and, and allow the spaces for them to, to take time and, and think. The second element is the contextualization. Related to the conscientization process, the educational programs are developed not only with the purpose to understand the context and the social reality, but they are also customized to the particular context where the implementation takes place. The activities that accompany the learning process are sensitive to local and cultural traditions, and yet are also open to different per perspectives and enrich the journey. In multicultural societies, it is necessary to include the voices of the minorities and be sensitive to the cultural differences. The essence of the learning to live together lies on the possibility to interact with people of other cultures and religious traditions, to exchange views, enter into dialogue and share the learning process. The third component is spirituality. It is not always easy to define what a spirituality is, and in many cases it's even easier to say what it is not. In a way, spirituality is that it's something that goes beyond, something that we cannot describe. It goes beyond an institutionalized religion, it's something that, that perhaps moves us, it's something that makes us uh, question ourselves who we are, where are we here, where are we going. It's a quest that accepts that there is more than life, that there is something that we cannot see. Is placing oneself in the universe. And we believe in Arigato International that this is a very critical component in education, that children have those spaces to think about who they are and to think and to how they relate to, uh, to others, how others are shaping who they are. This dynamic of kind of liberation, of empowerment, of moving beyond from the immediate to the ultimate, from answers to questions, always questioning, always uh, feeding in their minds of children their capacity to imagine, to ask questions. And if there are no answers, that's okay, because there might be more questions. And that is important in our educational systems. If we confine our children to answers, to specific ways of doing things, we are cutting in a way their potential to develop who they are, the potential to develop their creativity and innovation. And in a way, we are uh, creating boxes in children that can lead to them to become more extreme in their views or in a way to, to stop being critical thinkers. And that can be uh, a way to, for them to move or to be radicalized and move into violent extremist groups. The last component is critical thinking. It goes beyond the capacity to argue against uh, or in favor of a belief or an idea. It is the capacity to understand others' arguments, find alternatives, and challenge one's view and perspective of the world without being afraid of shaping one's identity. Um, this is an essential component of the learning to live together. And I believe if we want to challenge violent extremism and to prevent the recruitment of uh, children into, and young people into violent extremist groups, we need to ensure 
that children are developing critical thinking skills, that they are aware of uh, the, the different possibilities, that they can make well-grounded decisions, that they, can, they are able to decide, and that they, when they decide, they can balance their views and balance their decisions and say, this impacts me, it impacts my society, it impacts the people around me, what are the consequences of my, of my acts? That when they are given information, they have the capacity to analyze that information and to think what this means for the other, what it means for themselves, for their society, and being able to say yes or not. It's not about us imposing in them and telling them how to decide, but for them to be able to make decisions by themselves. In conclusion, quality education programs that are designed to learn to live together are powerful tools to prevent violent extremism and foster a sense of belonging, of community, of inclusion. They can support the creation of spaces where young people feel safe to speak, develop themselves, transform and work together with others. Most importantly, they can be powerful avenues to develop critical thinking. However, as I mentioned before, programs in schools are not sufficient. They should be accompanied by non-formal education, by work with media and with families. Violent extremism cannot be challenged by creating education programs that are geared towards correcting extremism or with the aim to change individuals whose views we consider extreme. It, can, it cannot either be challenged with programs that aim to deal with the problem rather than addressing the causes and possible conditions that lead young people to adhere to violent extremist views. It can only be challenged at the educational level by developing inclusive educational spaces, educational approaches and methodologies that go beyond the traditional approach that considers the increasingly diverse and multicultural dynamics of societies and responds to the structural conditions that hamper the inclusive development of participation of all groups of society and, uh, and individuals. And, and those conditions that in a way inhibit the growth of mutual understanding and respect. Thank you very much. If you want to learn more about our program, if you are interested to engage in dialogue with me, don't hesitate to contact me to this email you see here, and I look forward to, to hearing from you. Thank you.